from the Global Toronto Newsroom, this is Focus Ontario with Leslie Roberts and John Tory. Welcome to Focus Ontario. Something a little different this week, John. We're talking about when politics trumps journalism. Uh, case in point is the situation down south. We know clearly that partisan politics seems to have replaced journal journalism of late. Some concern that same thing is starting to happen here. Well, I, life is more complicated now for a journalist and for a politician. The immediacy of media uh, makes it more complicated. Uh, the competition, therefore, makes it more complicated. And I think, indeed, the role has changed. And I think that started maybe back in the 1970s, but I think it's kept progressing. And I'm worried about it just in the context that I think if the viewers out there were to say, well, where can I go to find just the facts of what happened? I'm not sure there's any place left you could refer them. Yeah. You know, and, and that may be fine. People can then say, well, they have a thousand opinions to choose from. But, I mean, how do they know which one is authoritative and based on facts? So I think that's what we're going to talk about today. Exactly. We have representatives of academia from journalism to join us in just a, a couple of seconds. But first, a little background for you on what all the fuss is about this week. A strange sight to go with a strange story. The mayor giving reporters a tour of the land behind his property. A day earlier, he had confronted Daniel Dale, a reporter for the Toronto Star. Rob Ford accused him of invading his family's privacy. They were here. They were in taking pictures. I have witnesses here. Dale says he was simply researching a story about a piece of land the mayor wants to buy near his home. I thought that I would be a diligent journalist and go and see where this property was, um, what it looked like. It's a classic he said, he said story, not unusual in the field of journalism, but it's also different in a number of ways. The mayor and the star already have a very strained relationship. The star even ran an editorial cartoon making fun of the incident and Ford's battle to lose weight. And it's not the first time the mayor's weight has been made light of. Then on Ford's weekly radio show, a Sun News Network host said this. I just want to apologize to you. I want to apologize for my profession. I want to apologize for those journalists that are acting in a despicable manner to you. I want to apologize for the people at the Toronto Star and Now Magazine. But listen carefully. That was a commentator apologizing on behalf of journalists. And there's a big difference. To be clear, journalists are paid to pursue the facts of a story. Commentators, columnists, and political cartoonists are paid for their opinion. So, are the lines beginning to blur? And can we assume all viewers, readers, and listeners know the difference? What are the implications? Just asking. We are in search of answers to some of those questions. Joining us here in studio is uh, Tony Berman, former head of CBC News, English Network of Al Jazeera, and now professor of journalism at Ryerson. Good to see you. Thanks for your Great time to today. Great to be here. Also with us, columnist with the National Post, sometimes fill-in host for this man over here at News Talk 1010, Matt Gurney. Good to see you. Good to be here. And from our Queen's Park Bureau, we have our Queen's Park Bureau chief, Alan Carter. Hi there, Alan. Hi, guys. All right, let's begin, if I can ask you, Tony, because you, uh, just sure. by the years of experience and the interest in terms of the CBC, Al Jazeera, now a journalism professor, John said earlier he was worried about the evolution of journalism. Are you? Yeah, I, I think I am. I think I am. I, I think the pattern uh, is a very negative one in the U.S., and I think that journalists are copycats, so are media companies, and so I think there is a, there is a, a, uh, you know, a risk that some of the practices down south will be imported north. Although I must say, I think the, the Canadian audiences are, are pretty discerning. I think the, the collapse or the failure of, for example, Sun Television is a good example of what may perhaps perhaps work in the U.S. doesn't necessarily catch on here. It's collapse meaning they're not getting viewers, they're still in business, it's just nobody's watching. Correct. There are probably more people on this panel than they have in their audience. <laughs> but, you know, you know. Are you concerned, Matt? Uh, a little bit, yeah. We should I mean, say, of course, you also write editorial, so you're not a, a, a journalist in search of the facts. You get yeah. to, to express your opinion. I do. Uh, I, I'm very glad of that. I have many opinions to express. But, you know, I mean, I very much need good reporting in order to do my job effectively. If I'm going to have good opinions and informed opinions, I can't be everywhere at once. I work out of Toronto. I write a lot about federal politics. I rely on good Ottawa-based reporting to write on that stuff. And sometimes it can be hard to find. And sometimes when I'm just in Google doing my research looking for uh, what happened, all I'm finding is commentary and I'm thinking to myself my god where did all these opinions come from every hit is someone else's take on it I just want the record so I can make my opinion and then uh, write about that and we should say you're not paid to drive a platform you're paid to give your opinion the yeah. insight as opposed to perhaps a political spin doctor mm -hmm. who's trying to get a story into the newspaper right. Alan do you get a lot of pressure at Queens Park from those spin doctors I mean you live and breathe it every day well sure you know there's an endless parade of uh, uh, of flax as we sometimes call them uh, from various e either the ministries or from the parties themselves that will come in and 
and try and sway you one way or the other. And the way they do that is, is uh, different. You know, sometimes they just want to make sure that their version of the facts is in front of you as you write your story. Otherwise, it'll be more uh, pushy than that. They'll come in. I've a number of times had a, a certain party come into my uh, office and say, how come we weren't in your story yesterday? And I have to justify why it was one party's view did not make it in uh, to a minute and a half news piece. And often that's really the answer is that uh, time constraints and there are constraints that journalists are under at, at all times. Now, we, we, we all raised the flags here. What's driving it? Is it strictly ratings, do you think? People will watch because of opinion, i.e. Fox News? I think now, if you go back to the days, and I, like I was never a newspaper columnist nor a television reporter, but where you would file once a day, and that's all there was. And, and actually, that's all you probably could do because there wasn't much in the way of sort of news happening. Now news is happening all the time. Every story is getting updated almost by the minute. And I think that has created both a pressure on the journalists and a competition. And of course, there's been the pressure because of business, I think, to distinguish yourself from somebody else. So you might argue, if you were just reporting the facts, what's the difference between your story if you're in one newspaper or TV station and another one? And the answer is there shouldn't be much. But that's not very good for you know competitive differentiation between those different businesses. And so I think the long and the short of it is everybody now feels they have to add a spin or an angle or something. And you end up with something that's not just straightforward facts. I, I don't think we've gotten to that point. I think there are newsrooms and a lot of quality news organizations today here in Canada who know the d distinction between between facts and opinion, and I think that they they pursue it. And I think audiences also know the difference. I think the Toronto Star example, for example, it, it was to me a classic case of 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 news gathering. It was a credible uh, effort on the part of a very professional, award-winning journalist to, to try to understand a part of a story about a public official. So I don't think there was any blurring of anything except that the, the overreaction by th that rather uh, obsequious uh, Sun columnist on with R Rob Ford. But I, I think we sometimes collectively uh, cross the line, but I think in mo many cases our audiences kind of knock us back into But you know, Tony, to you and to Matt, I might ask this question, because I see it happening quite often, but maybe it's just me noticing, that there's more and more of these columns where somebody slaps the word analysis on it, where it would have been written by a person I would normally call a reporter, not a columnist. And they put analysis on because the person's written something that, God bless them, has that person's opinion and perspective in it, and it's maybe very interesting to read, but previously you would have said that person was a reporter that just told you what happened, now they're kind of telling you why or what they thought of it, and I see that happening very often. Yeah, but I, I do think that there's a there's a difference between analysis and opinion. Analysis is an effort by a by a reporter in many cases to to extract from the facts and to kind of help their audiences, their viewers, their readers understand what the pattern is. Opinion is. In my view, this should happen. In my view, this shouldn't happen. I don't think that's really within the purview of a reporter to do, but I think a reporter who does analysis isn't necessarily expressing quote unquote opinion. Well, let me there jump in here because, I mean, that's, it sort of touches on what, what I do. I mean, I write a blog every week on the ledge, which you can see at globaltoronto.com, uh, and, and where I try to provide that sort of analysis because I think, you know, especially when you're covering politics, there is so much spin. Everything is spun. I mean, you look at the way the Liberals are handling their dispute with the Ontario doctors and telling you uh, how much money they make. Well, that's their side. The doctors have another side. I think audiences look for analysis. They look for someone who does cover this to try and cut through all of these counter spins yep. to spin give some sort of real uh, uh, evaluation of what is going on. Spin is part of the story is what you're saying. Well, I, I, one thing with analysis that can be interesting is a couple times as a columnist, I've written pieces that I have asked to be shown as analysis because they were a little more newsy and not necessarily reflecting my opinion. So I've kind of stripped all my opinion out of it and I have brought in my own expertise on an issue, something I'm very strong on. I've written kind of a straight piece explaining a complicated issue and I've left my opinion out of it and I've said, I don't want to be blurred uh, as a reporter or a columnist. I want to be very clear I'm a columnist. Let's just call this an analysis piece. But you know, so, oh, sorry, Matt, no. I was going to say to, Le to Alan though, I mean, is, when, when he he says he's writing a blog about the spin. Isn't that spin too, uh, Alan? I mean, I, it's it's your spin uh, that goes with theirs. I mean, and I'm not criticizing yours or theirs. I'm just saying, isn't it all just people's opinions? Well, I, I mean, you know, the, the truth is subjective, and so uh, I guess in in many cases you you are right. But I mean, I think you need to, as a journalist, present here's the spin on this side, here's the spin on that side, and I believe the truth lies here in the middle. And you know, you, you try and present that uh, as evenly and fairly as you possibly can.
And I think viewers, readers, listeners also more sophisticated than they were a decade ago where they say, I want more to the story. Maybe that's part of it as well, driving this. We'll take a short break. We'll continue our discussion right after this on Focus Ontario. Welcome back to Focus Ontario, continuing our discussion. Now, Matt wants to talk about the consumer, that is the reader, the listener, the viewer specifically, and how they're changing journalism. Well, I mean, Tony had mentioned, I think he's right about this, that there is a discerning audience out there, and they will uh, latch onto something and say, hey, this isn't true, I've read this in another outlet, and this is factually wrong. So they do keep you honest in that sense, but also kind of as a journalist, as a columnist, when I see sometimes what I've written about, I've written about an important public policy issue, an important social trend, a breaking political news, and then I look at the web traffic we're getting, and Tiger Woods and his marital problems is yeah. getting 50 times the traffic of that. And there have been days where we and our editorial board have just worked really hard to craft a piece that we think is important and no one will ever read it and it's instantly apparent uh, to us that that's the case. So the audience is discerning but they're also pretty frustrating too. Well, and, and we, I, we're seeing the CBC, we'll give you the example, back when you were running the network, we wouldn't see some of the stories that are being done today just because the CBC didn't touch that low-end journalism, if I say that. Yeah. But if it, the viewer wants it and you didn't used to care about the numbers of the CBC, suddenly things have changed. <laughs> so we're seeing things that we're doing on mainstream that is now being done at the CBC. And you're selling ad time, or they are. They are. <laughs> they are. I'm not. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a balancing act, and yeah. I think that clearly as, as the interests of the, of the audiences expand, as we're able to kind of monitor them, um, I think we've got to be kind of open-minded and not be too... Um, you know, too pretentious uh, or presumptuous, but I mean, I, I do think... At the CBC, never. Even at the CBC. <laughs> but, but I do think at the end of the day that people come to news organizations for news and for information and for some insight and for some help to navigate their way through the world. And if we give them uh, celebrity crap, uh, they will eventually, I think, turn away from us. And its quality is going gonna, is gonna to determine yeah. the future. Yeah. But Talk Radio is a good example here, John. You uh, host the afternoon show on News Talk 1010. There was a day when we had Gord Sinclair and Betty Kennedy doing interviews. Now we're seeing huge opinions. Uh, some of your hosts are a lot more right-wing uh, than m the Canadian way has been up until recently. Yeah, but I find, like in my own case, what I try to do is I ask the questions I think people will want to ask. Yeah. And when I don't get an answer, I'll ask it a second time. But I don't combat uh, the guests because I sort of figure it's not my job. Mm -hmm. And I think people respond well. It's back to the points I think both uh, Matt and Tony are making about people being fairly discerning. They're much smarter than they're given credit for. You just worry, though, that if, if the trend is inexorably towards fewer and fewer people who take that approach or who do true reporting in the context of newspapers or television, that there'll be nowhere left where they can discern, you know, because they're being told, which is what we've talked about in the U.S. And are we headed in that direction, you know, where, where there's going to be no place left you can go just to get the facts? And, you know, Tony says, no, we're not there and we're not even rapidly heading there, but it's the, the trend line is Are that. we going to stop it before it becomes that? Well, as Canadians? I mean, I think we've got to be vigilant. I think, like, programs like such as this are great. Uh, I was away in the Middle East for almost four years, and I came back to Washington, actually, not to Toronto, and I was appalled. It was like Rip Van Winkle waking up. I was appalled at the state of the, of the American media in, while I was gone. I didn't have that same view about the Canadian media. I think there's a lot of quality news organizations and quality journalists uh, that will do what they can in partnership with their audiences to keep the quality up. You know, so I'm, on this, in this sense, a, an optimist. Matt? I think the American media market's a little more complicated, pardon me, a little more simplistic than ours is because it's left versus right. I mean, here we have left, center, right in every different region of the mm. country. So it's harder to kind of throw everything, every resource into being this voice that's shouting at this voice, which shouts back. There's going to have to be a diversity of opinion and reporting out there just to reflect the Canadian news market. But no, I mean, I absolutely do see a trend towards more commentary and also getting to the point now where our commentary often uh, for us and other news outlets is what draws people to read your news. They look for your opinion, and if you're lucky, you get them to go click on the link and get to the news story. So it does work both ways. Like I said, I want as many reporters as possible, but I do see the trend, and sometimes I wonder if I'm ever going to have good information to write about in 10, 20 years. You know, we're seeing uh, the difference maybe is that head office in the United States will call and say, we need to, you know, spin the story this way, you covering uh, the Hill, whereas Alan Carter, I mean, you're a prime example where you go in, you gather the facts, you put the story together, there's never any pressure from above. 
No, and you don't ever, I don't ever feel that at all. I mean, you know, I, and I get asked that question all the time. Have you ever, you know, got a call from head office from, you know, from Calgary that says, I want this angle on that story? And that, that does not happen. But, you know, you, you talk about, you know, this, this slash between analysis and commentary and reporting. I mean, think of the four major dailies in Toronto. I think you, we all know where they line up politically on the editorial side. That doesn't mean that they don't all have excellent straight ahead factual reporting i think both coexist in canada and i think we should be really proud of that and story selection and who they interview may play into it as much as uh, where the where it's placed in the paper and there's a lot of angles and to your point alan i just hope that the viewer the reader the listener uh, that we're not giving them too much credit that they understand that there is you know a political slant or a slant and i won't call it political with every outlet uh, regardless of the the journalism that is done matt gurney Tony Berman, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, John, and I will be back with the rest of the show right after. And we'll tell him he can't be heard on the McGinty government. There you are. <laughs> yes, he will, not me. We'll be right back. <laughs> no, you will. Welcome back to Focus Ontario. Time to talk about the news of the week. And Alan, it had to be the health minister's message to the doctors, our top headline. Yeah, and this sort of plays on uh, last week's Focus Ontario episode where we talked about labour negotiations, the Liberals moving unilaterally to slash fees that doctors charge for some OHIP services, saying that they simply had no choice. The government says it'll save $338 million dollars and the new head of the OMA on his first day on the job clearly decided that ratcheting down the rhetoric was not the way to go saying that the move is going to cause a new brain drain for doctors in this province. These cuts are going to make it difficult to recruit new doctors to the province and doctors who are finishing medical school in Ontario who will have significant debt load are going to be looking to move elsewhere. I've yet to find a jurisdiction that pays their doctors more than we do in Ontario. So I just don't buy the argument that, uh, that doctors will leave this province. That's the uh, key talking point for the doctors. They keep pointing out on average how, many, how much money uh, doctors bill OHIP uh, and that their, uh, their rates have gone up so substantially over the last eight years when the Liberals have been in power. It seems to drop out of the news, however, the last few days. Well, but is he in, who's interested that in? The government's. Because at the end of the day, if the story goes away because the doctors don't have it, now they're going to start a big ad campaign, but I'm not sure what they're going to say. If they were going to say, well, look, yeah, we make this money, but we're prepared to make these concessions, just not the ones the government jammed on us, different story. But they're just saying kind of, they look like they're saying no, no, a thousand times no. And the public are saying, these are people that make four, five, six hundred thousand, and they, they respect them. But they're saying, what are you offering up in tough times? So what do they do now? Well, I mean, I, I think they should go back to the table. And the doctors say, okay, let's sit down and we'll try and help you find your savings, but we're going to do it in a way that isn't you dictating it. We'll do it together. But they've got to acknowledge that we need those savings in tough times. Moving on, last week it was Elizabeth Whitmer who made some headlines, and Dalton McGinty apparently is hoping to uh, grab a few more. Yeah, reports that uh, he told the Liberal caucus that the Liberals are courting other MPPs, uh, both across the floor and possibly with other plum jobs. Uh, when asked about it in the House, this was his response. People on those benches, and I want to be very public about the Speaker, who want to come over and sit on this side of the floor, Speaker, they will be welcomed with open arms, they will be treated graciously. <laughs> speaker, this is, this is very... <laughs> Speaker, this is very difficult for me to say, but there will be no exceptions. It will all be well. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think Ontarians find it very funny either. I mean, I think Ontarians are wondering, you know, why the, the priority of the Premier is about, uh, you know, which MPP might be ripe for the pickings as opposed to, uh, you know, which kinds of uh, policy changes they can make to make life better for everyday folks. So we have to keep our eye on this, I mean, because there are uh, obviously uh, government plum positions out there. And will the government be able to uh, persuade another MPP, if not to cross the floor and join the Liberals, but to perhaps step down the way that uh, Ms. Whitmer did. I mean, nobody can be pure on this, Leslie. I will confess, when I was the opposition leader, we were trying to lure liberals to come across at a time when they weren't very popular. Uh, we didn't have any jobs to offer. But at the end of the day, it goes on. Uh, and I think Mr. McGinty's approach to it actually is exactly the right one, where you sort of say, well, you know, all are welcome, and I might think of making some exceptions, but no, no, I guess I better say everybody's welcome. He, I don't think they're up to much right now. I think they've got one. There'll be this by-election, which I think there's a chance they could win. Yeah. Uh, and then they won't have to bother much anymore. But, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Andrew Horvath is, is presuming too much when she thinks anybody's actually worked up or paying any much attention to this. 
Dr. Chris Mazza back in the news, uh, not because he made his appearance, but because, Alan, he won't be making an appearance. Yeah, now, of course, uh, we've all been looking forward to this May 16th. The uh, speaker's warrant issued for Dr. Chris Mazza, the former CEO of Orange, and word from the committee that they have received uh, some reports and that he will not be testifying on the 16th. Uh, reportedly, this is due to health concerns. Here's Franz Jelena, the NDP member who is on that committee uh, looking into Orange. But basically, uh, he will be invited to come a little bit later uh, and, and we have uh, respected uh, the information that was shared with us. And uh, in respect of that, we have postponed when Dr. Mazza will come. So no appearance next week by Dr. Matza, but an appearance this week by Ernie Eves, who is going to be hung in the legislature. Uh, his official portrait unveiled as Mr. Eves will now be a permanent fixture down at Queen's Park. The portrait of the 23rd Premier painted by Bernard Poulin. Eves was Premier from April 2002 to October 2003, and the speech was pure Eves as he took shots at just pretty much everybody. He had job, jabs at uh, McGinty, uh, at uh, former Premier Harris, uh, and, and a big turnout for that. Yeah, these are kind of special events, but Ernie Eves is a guy who doesn't pull any punches. When he sort of starts casting his jokes about at other people's expense, and I mean that in a lighthearted, humorous way, they're usually zingers, and there's nobody that isn't a target. But it's a nice day. When you've served as Premier, I never, I never looked down on anybody who made it to that office. I tried and didn't. People did. And I think when you do, that's a huge accomplishment, and uh, he deserves that. He never took the, well, never won an election, though. He just No, replaced. he did not. But he became the Premier of Ontario, and I guess in our history, what, 23 people have? And that's pretty good going. So I, to me, I don't look down on them if they last six days. I figure, well, you made it, and that's good for you. Okay, Alan, as always, uh, we can uh, get news from you between uh, Focus Ontario's. Yes, uh, you can uh, read my blog on the ledge. Uh, that is at uh, globaltoronto.com. And of course, for real-time updates of what's going on at Queen's Park, follow me on Twitter. As well, of course, every night of the news hour at 5.30 and news hour final at 11. Alan Carter, Queen's Park. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. John's final thoughts right after this. Don't go away. Welcome back to Focus Ontario. I want to uh, end the program where we began, and that is, I guess, the um, polarization, if you like, of society, not just journalism. You want to make a point yeah, about... Well, it's happening voters. everywhere. I mean, the media, and who's to know who's leading it? But the politicians are seemingly deliberately polarizing people. You're either with me or against me. It's either black or it's white. And then you have the media that I think we talked are increasingly sort of taking opinion, one of pro or con. And I think it's causing the people to become that way. And whereas there used to be the big bulk of Canadians who sort of sat there and said, I'm going to make up my mind day by day, issue by issue, based on what I hear, now they're even finding themselves, well, I'm either for or against something, and they react negatively, actually, if you sort of try to provide a balanced analysis. So I think, yes, people are discerning, but they're becoming more polarized themselves, and that's the worrisome part. So this is not a case where people look at the platform of an election campaign prepared to vote, depending on what they like better, but the party is what's. No, and the them. platforms are set up now in such a way to polarize people. Huh. You know, you're for or against something. There is no in-between position, and I think that's just not the way life is. But anyway, I guess we'll see what happens. All right, that's it for us this week. Thanks for joining us. Focus is back in seven days. Lots of ways to reach us. For John Torrey, I'm Leslie Roberts. We'll see you in seven days.